focus on headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio today, Yoon Hae Jung and Chang Ana. Guys, welcome back. Happy Chuseok to you guys. Happy, Happy Chuseok. Okay, so anything for Chuseok holiday? Go anywhere? Hae Jung? Not really. I just visited my grandmother. That was basically, that was it. <laughs> Not far though, right? Not far Not though. Not far. Hannah, what about you? Do anything well, for Chuseok holiday? Well, same here. I just met up with my friends, my relatives, and I just visited my grandmother who's in uh, Gyeonggi-do, Gwangju. Oh, mm. that's I Th- used to live there. I used far. to yeah, it's not that far. Mm. I used to live there a long time ago. All right, awesome stuff. Good to guys. Good to have you guys in the studio today on this last day of the Chuseok <laughs> holiday. Uh, we're gonna start things off here. Uh, back into the grind, uh, covering some of the headlines here. And uh, as always, North Korea continuing with their missile provocations, having launched multiple short-range ballistic missiles uh, on. Wednesday today, just five days after revealing its facility for producing highly enriched uranium, which is used to manufacture nuclear warheads. Hannah, you're going to start us off. Let's get the latest on North Korea's latest provocation. What do you have for us? Sure. Now, according to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, South Korea's military detected several SRBMs launched from the Kecheon area in South Pyongan province, heading northeast around 6.50 a.m. The missiles flew approximately 400 kilometers, and South Korean and U.S. authorities are conducting a detailed analysis of their specifications. It was determined that at least two missiles were launched, but... Due to the northeast trajectory and the curvature of the Earth, uh, traject- uh, tracking the final impact point was limited. Now, there is speculation that the missiles were aimed at the Pido Island in the East Sea, a known SRBM testing site for North Korea, located about 400 kilometers from the launch site in Kecheon. And Japan's Ministry of Defense confirmed that the missiles landed outside Japan's exclusive economic zone. Now, North Korea had previously announced plans in July to conduct additional SRBM tests with a range of about 250 kilometers, but had not followed through until now, leading to speculation that this launch may be part of that delayed test. And recently, North Korea has ramped up its provocations and military demonstrations as the U.S. presidential election approaches after focusing on large-scale flood recovery efforts over the summer. And on July 1st, North Korea launched SRBMs and later on July 24th, threatened another test but did not conduct any further launches until now. And on the 12th, North Korea also fired multiple rounds of its KN-25 Super Large Multiple Rocket Launcher, using a six-barrel launcher to showcase its simultaneous strike capability. And additionally, on the 13th, state media revealed for the first time at North Korea's facility for producing highly enriched uranium used in nuclear warheads. North Korea has also been frequently launching propaganda balloons towards South Korea with incidents occurring on the 4th to 8th, 11th, and 14th to 15th of this month. The JCS strongly condemned North Korea's missile launches, stating that North Korea's missile launches are a clear act of provocation that seriously threatens peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. And the military will closely monitor North Korea's activities and maintain a robust rock us combined defense posture prepared to overwhelmingly respond to any provocations. Now, I do wonder, right? Uh, one of the things that uh, the new uh, defense chief, uh, Kim Yong-hyun, said during his inauguration speech was that uh, any provocation from the North is going to be met with will mean the end of the regime. It was a pretty, pretty uh, hard line comments coming out from the new defense minister uh, almost uh, two weeks ago. And so what will this mean now? We did get some you know, provocations after he met this, right? I mean, there was another short-range ballistic missile uh, provocation, I think, a few days ago as well, well last week as well. Uh, this is the latest one. But so far, not, not a lot of message coming in uh, from the defense minister himself. And we're, there were concerns that if he is going to go with an even harder line stance compared to the uh, former defense minister that it might raise even more tensions on the Korean Peninsula. But so far, uh, nothing yet. No response measures from South Korea other than these uh, remarks from the JCS. Uh, North Korean Foreign Minister Choi Son hee having met with her Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov uh, over in uh, Moscow to discuss the Pyongyang-Moscow relationship. The two met on Tuesday local time, discussed ways to develop bilateral ties in line with the comprehensive strategic partnership forged 
between the leaders, Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin back in June. Hey Jung, let's get the latest on this uh, meeting. Right. North Korea's foreign minister, Choi son yi is in Russia to attend the Eurasian Women's Forum and the BRICS Women's Forum in St. Petersburg. Eyes were on whether Choi son yi and Sergei Lavrov have discussed coordinating Kim Jong-un's potential visit to Russia, as well as cooperating on arms trade and transfer of advanced technology. And earlier, Russian state media reported that President Vladimir Putin is scheduled to give a speech at the Eurasian Women's Forum this week, which raised speculation that Putin and Che could meet. So there was a lot of attention surrounding Che and Putin's potential meeting, but the Kremlin has announced that no such plan has been scheduled. And Putin and Choi's previous meeting took place at the Kremlin during Choi's visit to Moscow back in January. In the meantime, last Friday, Sergei Shoigu, Secretary of Russia's Security Council, met with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Pyongyang and vowed to deepen, deepen the bilateral ties between the two countries, according to Russia's state media. The meeting came on the anniversary of a rare summit between Kim and Putin last year at the Vostochny Cosmodrome Space Center in Russia, during which Kim pledged his full support for Moscow. It is reported that during their talks on Friday, Kim and Shoigu reached a satisfactory consensus on the presented issues, such as deepening the uh, strategic dialogue and cooperation between the two countries to defend the mutual security interests. Russia the Security Council said in a statement that the meeting between Shoigu and Kim had a highly trusting and friendly atmosphere, uh, which is also in line with the agreement reached between the two leaders during uh, Russian pre- President Vladimir Putin's state visit to North Korea back in June. Yeah, so this meeting is quite interesting because before uh, Che son made her trip to Russia, there was some reports coming out from the NIS, uh, the National uh, Intelligence Service, saying that uh, Che son might actually go to Ru- Russia in place of what she was supposed to initially be doing is going to uh, New York for the UN General Assembly, which I believe she hasn't done in a really, really long time. Uh, I believe there was, when you looked at the itinerary or like uh, one of the some, some report released by the UN General Assembly, they said <clears throat> from North Korea, there was going to be some uh, foreign ministerial level official coming to uh, the UN General Assembly. There is one foreign minister, Choi son And so everyone said, well, wow, this is uh, quite surprising. But nevertheless, uh, there might be some interesting messages coming from Pyongyang through its top diplomat. And it seems like with this trip to Russia, she is now no longer going to be headed towards the UN General Assembly. Who knows? Maybe a change in uh, the scheduling. But from what I understand, if she does take part in these meetings in Russia, that she probably will not. Highly unlikely. Uh, that uh, she's going to be making her trip over to New York. So, again, it seems like the report from the NIS is true, Uh, certainly showing the growing uh, relations between Moscow and uh, Pyongyang. Uh, In the meantime, U.S. Army Lieutenant General Xavier T. Brunson, uh, the nominee for the new commander of the Iraq-U.S. Combined Forces Korea, or U.S. Forces Korea, uh, identified North Korea's advancements in nuclear and missile capabilities as the greatest challenge uh, faced by the Combined Forces Command and other commands and emphasize the importance of the fight tonight readiness posture. Hannah, let's get more from uh, uh, Lieutenant General Brunson. Sure. Now, in his opening remarks at the confirmation hearing before the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee on Tuesday local time, Brunson stated that North Korea's rapid advancements in nuclear and missile capabilities, combined with its ambition to exponentially expand its nuclear arsenal, pose the greatest single challenge faced by the three commands. The three commands he referred to include the Iraq U.S. Combined Forces Command, U.S. Forces Korea, and the United Nations Command, all of which Brunson will command if confirmed by the Senate. Now, Brunson affirmed his understanding of the threats facing South Korea and emphasized that his role is to ensure the continued readiness of all forces deployed on the Korean Peninsula. He reiterated that fight tonight is not just a slogan, but a reality for the men and women 
serving in Korea. And he pledged to properly train and equip U.S. forces to be ready for competition, crisis, or conflict. He also cited the maintenance and strengthening of the Iraq-U.S. alliance and managing the Korean Peninsula armistice as top priorities. Brunson concluded his remarks by saying, let's go together under the banner of flight tonight, using the Korean phase katsi kapshida, which is translated to let's go together, which is a symbolic motto of the alliance. And during the subsequent Q&A session, Brunson stressed the importance of engaging with South Korean partners to share insights and hold higher level level discussions. He emphasized the need to reassure South Korean partners that the U.S. presence includes not only a conventional defense umbrella, but also a nuclear umbrella. In addressing some discussions within South Korea about independent nuclear armament, Brunson noted that denuclearization of the Korean peninsula explains many things and acknowledge that some discussions are sovereign matters. He emphasized that the U.S. should build trust in existing consultative mechanisms like the U.S. Rock Nuclear Consultative Group and reassure partners to prevent further discussions on independent nuclear armament from taking place. Yeah, the Kachi Kapshida, that uh, slogan has been used uh, quite a bit uh, during the Biden administration. And uh, if you go to a lot of the, the U.S. embassy uh, events. Uh, the the ambassador, the the vice minister, deputy minister, uh, sorry, the deputy ambassador, uh, always uh, using this as their sort of uh, toast uh, slogan too. Right. Uh, made it up over in London says Xavier T. Brunson sounds like he should be commanding a SAR fleet of intergalactic vessels. You know, I was just saying last week when we were, when we were talking about him uh, that he had like the most general esque name. And he should be leading an army. It's, it's a pretty cool name, Xavier. Uh, let's move on here. The Republic of Korea Strategic Command, a control tower to counter North Korea's nuclear and miss uh, weapons of mass destruction, will be officially launched next month. Uh, Hejong, let's get the latest updates on this. According to South Korean military officials on Wednesday, the ROK Strategic Command will be established under the Joint Chiefs of Staff to be located at Seoul's Namtaeryeong Capital Defense Command. The Strategic Command will be tasked with deterring North Korea's nuclear and WMD threats by integrating and commanding South Korea's strategic assets, including Hyunmu ballistic missiles, stealth fighter jets, and 3,000-ton submarines. The establishment of the strategic command also increases the size of the ROK military's organization to counter North Korea's threats. The command will also focus on developing Korea Massive Punishment and Retaliation, or KMPR, which is an operational plan to incap incapacitate the North's leadership in a major conflict, and the Kill Chain Preemptive Strike Platform, which is part of the military's three-axis deterrent system. And the the Strategic Command will initially be centered on the Air Force Operations Command. This is because transferring all the functions to the st Strategic Command at once could reduce operational efficiency. The command will also serve as a counterpart to the U.S. Strategic Command, which controls early warning systems of intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and nuclear threats. The ROK Strategic Command will closely coordinate with the U.S. Command to discuss the development of conventional nuclear integration development and lead related exercises. It's interesting that the Nam Tae Young uh, Capital Defense Command is the one that I drive by every time I come to work, but uh, it's, it's not too far away from here. Uh, but, you know, we've talked about how with like all these uh, Urchi Freedom Shields, uh, uh, military drills and other drills, the joint military drills that happens uh, annually, it's all defensive in nature. But the one that you know, North Korea could come out and say, oh, your Urchi Freedom Shield exercises, it's a plan for invasion tactics and things like that. No. It's defensive in nature, but there is one thing that South Korea openly says is not defensive in nature. It's the Korea massive punishment and retaliation. That's the one that North Korea is really, really scared of, and that we have no idea how they plan to do this. But that is in case there is a war invasion from North Korea, and uh, South Korea quickly moves into Pyongyang and uh, just eliminates all the leadership, including, I'm sure, Kim Jong-un. So uh, this is all in place. And one of the ways to respond to some of the provocations, uh, continuous uh, mentioning of this uh, Korea Massive Punishment Retaliation and uh, the, the three axes, the turn system, the mentioning of this could be one of the responses from all the provocations from North Korea. Uh, let's move on here on Tuesday. President Yoon Sung-yeol visit the Frontline Army 15th Division in Gangwon Province. 
to encourage these soldiers who are serving to defend the nation during the Chuseok holiday, allowing citizens to enjoy the holiday in a safe way. Hannah, let's get more on his visit. Sure. Now, President Yoon first visited the Sungni Uwon, or translated into Victory Clinic, part of the 15th Division's uh, Medical Battalion, which provides medical services to both military families and local residents, making it the first army clinic to do so. And after receiving a briefing on the clinic's operations from Brigadier General Kang Hyun Woo, the 15th Division Commander uh, President Yoon greeted local residents and military families from Hwacheon County and toured the clinic's department including the dentistry, pediatrics, ophthalmology, and the emergency room. And according to presidential spokesperson Chong, President Yoon told the 15th Division commanders that if the enemy provokes us, we will respond immediately and overwhelmingly according to the principle of act first, report later, to completely crush the uh, enemy's will. And President Yoon also promised that I will do my best as the commander-in-chief to improve working conditions so that our soldiers can focus on their duties with that worry and to make them feel proud to wear the military uniform. He emphasized the importance of defense and security, stating that the national defense and security are the most critical functions of the state, and the national economy can only stand on the foundation of national security, so the soldiers' efforts are the backbone of our country's economy. Let's move on here. Uh, we had, again, uh, a very long uh, holiday. I uh, went from Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and today is the last day, five day. I know some people took Friday off, went for a six day. I know took some people took Thursday off and then went Thursday, Friday, <laughs> and then just over and over and over again. I know some people are taking tomorrow and Friday off to just continue to extend this Tuesday <laughs> holiday. But the big concern over this, and we go through this even during a regular Chuseok holiday or Sarla holiday, one of those extended holidays, that there is going to be a shortage of uh, emergency room doctors and so forth, but all the more ever since the prolonged walkout from the junior doctors. But despite fears and concerns, uh, and uh, of course, uh, a patient, uh, news of a patient heavily wounded spending four hours in Daejeon uh, looking for an emergency room, the government says there were no major disruptions on Chuseok Day. That was Tuesday. Yesterday was the actual Chuseok Day uh, when most of the most number of hospitals were closed. But uh, Hejong, let's get more on the hospital situation during the Chuseok holiday. All right. Starting on Monday, the day right before Chuseok, an emergency report was made on a man that had been stabbed in the stomach with a weapon in Daejeon. Now, the wound was about 30 centimeters long, but the patient couldn't find an emergency room that accepted him right away. So he was transferred to a hospital in Cheonan four hours later. Uh, FYI, Cheonan and Daejeon is approximately 55 kilometers apart. So the latest concern surrounding the Chuseok holidays was what should you do in the event that you need to visit the emergency room. Uh, as of Tuesday, all but two of the country's 409 emergency rooms were open, but 407 of them were struggling to accept mild cases due to a shortage of medical staff. And the government said there was no major disruptions in medical service during the Chuseok holidays, uh, which a lot of people were worried about. Health officials explained that treatment Treatment at emergency medical centers across the country mostly ran smoothly without long waits. They attributed this to the distributed transfer of patients according to their condition to prevent overcrowding in emergency rooms. For instance, the emergency department of Chungbuk National University Hospital, which is a regional emergency medical center, was largely uninterrupted on Tuesday, Chuseok. Uh, Jeonnam National University Hospital and Choson University Hospital, which are tertiary hospitals in the Gwangju and Jeollanamdo regions, were also operating as usual. Uh, emergency departments at major hospitals in Jeollabukdo province were also not overcrowded. The emergency room at Uijongbu St. Mary's Hospital in the northern Gyeonggi-do region was not crowded as well, although ambulances were constantly coming and going, transferring emergency patients. The emergency room at Aju University Hospital in Suwon, Gyeonggi-do province was also uncrowded. So overall, like the health authorities have confirmed, most emergency rooms were open for critical patients. Yeah, so that's what it is, right? I mean, if you're turning back uh, patients who have mild symptoms, uh, then you're obviously going to have relatively uh, empty 
emergency rooms, if you're only accepting critically ill patients or critically injured patients, uh, that's, I mean, that accounts for a very small, unfortunately, it accounts for a very small number of people. And so aside from, boy, the person who's been stabbed in a 30 centimeter long stab wound, that's, that's pretty major there and 55 kilometers apart that's a pretty big one but overall though i mean just been uh, looking at some of the uh, reports there were no major ones and i do know that many people here in the country they were very very cautious over right. the truce of holiday to make sure <laughs> that i heard there was like less people eating uh this time around you know usually like you know, you go, <laughs> in case of food poisoning <laughs> you know, in case of food poisoning and things like that or if anything goes wrong they weren't traveling a whole lot and stuff or they're trying to avoid any sort of right uh, incidents. emergency cases yeah emergency cases and so it's uh what we are at right now and hopefully after the truce call they maybe some negotiation discussions uh, talks uh, between the medical community and the government uh ends up happening real soon. Uh, medical personnel will no longer be held accountable for refusing to treat non-emergency cases, such as cold or diarrhea, uh, emergency fis- medical facilities, or if they decline treatment due to staff shortages. Now, this change clarifies the previously ambiguous standards regarding the legal immunity of medical personnel. Hannah, tell us more about this. Sure. Now, according to the government and the medical community, the Ministry of Health and Welfare sent a notice titled Guidelines for Legitimate Reasons to Refuse Treatment under the Emergency Medical Act to the 17 Metropolitan and Provincial Governments, as well as the Korean Hospital Association, the Korean Medical Association, and the Korean Nurses Association. Now, Article 6 of the Emergency Medical Medical Act requires emergency medical workers to provide medical care when requested or when an emergency patient is identified. And through these new guidelines, the ministry has clarified examples of legitimate reasons for refusing treatment. First, the ministry has stated that medical personnel will not be held responsible for refusing to treat mild or non-emergency patients classified as levels 4 or 5 under the Korean triage and acuity scale in emergency rooms. Now, level 4 is categorized as semi-emergency, while level 5 is non-emergency. And this provision allows emergency room staff to focus on critical patients, which is the primary purpose of emergency medical services. However, considering that many patients may not be able to accurately assess their own condition or severity, and thus may visit uh, emergency rooms out of caution, there is concern that the guideline lacks specific Uh, specificity and may cause confusion in practice. The ministry also defined instances of violence or potential violence in emergency rooms as legitimate grounds for refusing or avoiding treatment. Now, this includes cases where emergency medical personnel are subjected to assault, threats, coercion, or damage to medical equipment and facilities. And additionally, if a patient or their guardian creates a situation that could result in charges of defamation, assault, or obstruction, of business preventing the medical staff from providing normal care, such cases would also be considered legitimate reasons for refusing treatment. Moreover, the ministry has allowed medical personnel to refuse treatment if an emergency medical institution lacks sufficient staff, facilities, or equipment to provide appropriate care, or in cases where emergencies like communication or power outages or disasters such as fires prevent the treatment of patients. And medical staff may also refuse treatment if a patient or guardian refuses to follow the doctor's treatment plan or demands a treatment method that goes against the doctor's professional knowledge and conscience. Man, there's some uh, mixed feelings towards this. I mean, I guess there is now the absence of the Hippocratic Oath, right, which basically says you cannot uh, deny any medical treatments and things like that. And I think that there's more clarifications on this because there was some I guess, uh, word of mouth going around on the internet saying how to go about getting treated at emergency rooms. They were saying, technically, if you enter the emergency room and seek out medical care, you cannot legally be refused. And I think everybody was going through this loophole, right? I didn't know about this. So they were saying, if it's in, if it's not like a real, real emergency where you need the ambulance to get you to these emergency rooms where in terrible situations you might have to go round and round about right they're looking mm-hmm. for these emergency rooms they said if it, someone could drive you or even walk to the emergency room you have to be treated legally but now this eliminates basically all of this mm-hmm. right and uh, now which is why i heard that uh, now we have the truth of Kali done and over with uh, but uh, which is why the local clinics now neighborhood clinics have been packed packed with patients right now and they're running on uh, what is it uh, seven day schedules instead of their usual 
uh, five and a half. Usually they have a half day on Saturdays uh, and uh, they're off on Sundays, but they're going full full time right now, seven days because of uh, the lack of uh, emergency rooms right now. So whether they're benefiting from this, I mean, they're all being overworked, I don't know. But uh, this is the current situation right now here in this South Korean medical system. Uh, let's move on here. Boy, if I'm Trump, I, I've got to be really concerned with this. And then maybe, you know, running second term might be the least of my concerns right now. Uh, it was just two months ago when there was the first assassination attempt against U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump. And I say first because there was a yet another. And we know how close, how close Trump came from really being assassinated the first time around. Sunday local time, Trump was unharmed after an apparent second assassination attempt near his golf course in Florida. Turns out, the suspected gunman had been lurking for about 12 hours, undetected in his second assassination attempt of the former U.S. president. Really shows you what these, these, the security service, uh, Secret Service is doing with this. Hejong, uh, give us the latest on the assassination attempt. Right. On Monday local time, the U.S. Department of Justice charged 58-year-old Ryan Wesley Ruth with two federal counts. First, on possessing a firearm as a convicted felon and possession of a firearm with an obliterated serial number. Both charges carry a maximum sentence of 15 years in prison, and the indictment, which was released by U.S. media outlets, confirmed new details about the case. Now, according to the indictment, Trump was playing golf with an associate at his cl club in West Palm Beach, Florida. Here, a gunman was first spotted by Secret Service agents who were sweeping sweeping the course in the Trump International Golf Club at 1.31 p.m. on Sunday. And the muzzle of a rifle, an SKS semi-automatic, was spotted sticking through the shrubbery that lines the course. Agents fired four to five rounds of ammunition upon seeing the gun muzzle, and the suspect dropped the rifle and fled in a vehicle, abandoning, abandoning the weapon along with two bags, a scope for his rifle, and a GoPro camera. The suspect fled in a Nissan SUV with a license plate that was reported stolen, and he was apprehended at 2.14 p.m. on Highway Interstate 95. Of course, there were questions about how the suspect was able to spend nearly 12 hours undetected in the vicinity of the Trump International Golf Club before an agent spotted the danger. And the Secret Service came out admitting that they did not search in advance the perimeter of the golf course where the suspect has been lurking, and the organization is facing increased pressure over the alleged security failures. Uh, there is also concern over how Ryan Wesley Ruth knew Trump was likely to be playing golf at the Palm Beach course that day. Uh, although it is common knowledge that former pres the former president commonly plays golf at one of his courses on Sundays. Now, the Secret Service's acting director, Ronald Rowe Jr., explained to the journalists that the president wasn't even really supposed to be there, uh, adding that Trump did not have a visit to the course on his official schedule. Although he did not clarify wh uh, whether that meant the agents lacked the time to sweep the cores for security risks. Yeah, so, I mean, it, if you're going to find Trump, it, highly likely over the weekend, it's going to be a <laughs> golf course, right? I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, he just goes golfing all the time, even during when he was president. I think he went from, you know, during his campaign speeches, oh, I'm going to be so busy, I'm not going to be uh, playing, I can't, I'm not going to have enough time to play golf anymore, but, uh, you know, play more golf than any sitting U.S. president out there. But it is concerning, right? It's usually like, it, it's places where you're most familiar with that you feel very comfortable, but it's also the very places that you probably should be sweeping and doing some more investigation because that's places where people are most likely going to find them. Uh, one of the things that Mike Johnson, who was a speaker of the House, said uh, shortly after the second assassination attempt, which I think was a real dumb thing to say afterwards he called trump unstoppable right you don't call him unstoppable which now then that's going to spark other people from going oh is he really is trump really <laughs> unstoppable and probably make more assassination attacks this is a terrible thing right now i mean you could be a, very much against what trump's ideology and some of the stuff that he says and what he's brought uh, in the four years that he was in the office a lot of hate and stuff like that but it's another thing to t try to take a person's uh, life Terrible stuff, but now because of Mike Johnson's statement, I would I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised if there's other people out there, just like there are 
very, very far right conservatives. There are pretty radical lefts out there uh, who are very much against. And from what I understand, there's also many Republicans who are not big fans of mm-hmm. Trump and the ways that he is running uh, I guess his campaign and things like that. So hopefully this is something that uh, is a thing of the past and doesn't repeat itself. We are now about to, what less than two months away until the U.S. presidential elections in November. We'll see what other developing stories do pop out. Uh, let's move on here. Go over to the Middle East. Uh, hundreds of pagers. You heard that correct. Pagers, beepers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, primarily used by the militant group Hezbollah. Exploded simultaneously across Lebanon and departs of Syria as well on Tuesday local time, killing at least nine people, injuring 2,750. Uh, this according to the Lebanese health authorities. Hezbollah and the Palestinian group, uh, militant group Hamas blamed Israel for the explosions Valid retaliation for this, but uh, Hannah, what's the latest Mm. on this? Now, according to international media, the explosions occurred throughout Lebanon, focusing on Hezbollah strongholds such as southern Lebanon, the Beka Valley in the east, and the southern suburbs of Beirut. Now, the health ministry reported that nine were dead and 2,750 were injured, with around 200 of the injured in critical condition. The health authorities added that most victims sustained injuries to their hands, with some also suffering injuries to their hands and abdomen. And the explosions began around 3.30 p.m. and continued for about an hour, with some of the pagers exploding while victims were checking the screens after receiving alerts. This was according to foreign media reports. And media reported that Iran's ambassador to Lebanon was also injured, but not in critical condition at the moment. Iran, which supports Hezbollah and Hamas, condemned the explosions as an act of terror. Now, following a cabinet meeting, the Lebanese government, you unanimously condemned what it called a criminal attack by Israel, which it said was a blatant violation of Lebanon's sovereignty. And Lebanon's information minister, Ziad Makari, said they were in contact with the UN to hold Israel accountable. The Lebanese health ministry urged all citizens to dispose of their pagers immediately. The Hezbollah's supreme leader had warned in February that Israel could use mobile phones for location tracking and targeted attacks, urging followers not to use them. So so Hezbollah then introduced pagers in recent months to enhance communication security. The pagers that exploded reportedly had stickers from the Taiwanese company Gold Apollo. And Israel has not commented on the explosions yet, and the incident occurred less than a day after Israel's security cabinet officially added the safe return of residents in Israel's northern border regions near Lebanon as a war objective. I do wonder how they were able to even get them to explode uh, in the first place and whether this was uh, planned out uh, prior to all of this. But uh, interesting, I I did not know that pagers were still around. The pagers Mm -hmm. were a thing when I was like in middle school, right? Like in the 1990s. Yes. (laughs) Yes. You have to point out. (laughs) Yes, Hannah, I was was in middle school in the 1990s, late 1990s. But interesting story, you know, Korea was big on pagers back in the days and then shortly after pagers were no longer a thing and then cell phones were coming out. You know uh, what happened to the company that uh, a pager company, a beeper company in South Korea, what they did? Instead of giving up and closing down their business, they turned the pager business into that thing. When you go to like, uh, what is the it? Coffee the coffee shops yes. and cafes? Ah, yes. The one that vibrates. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's what they did. So they turned that technology Ooh, into something uh. else and they're still making a ton of money. Well, that's right. Uh, that's cool stuff. Anyways, the random information for all you <laughs> listeners out there. Uh, just uh, one final piece of story to share with all of our listeners out there before we do, do wrap up uh, this segment. According to Japan's Kyoto News Agency on Tuesday, Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, suspended work to remove nuclear fuel debris from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant due to a camera problem on a device placed inside the containment vessel. Uh, this is already the second time now they had to suspend the work. There was some uh, issues initially with some of the devices. They resumed it. Turns out they're going to be suspending again. And this is a crucial, crucial aspect of their long decommissioning project moving forward here. Hedging, let's get the details of this. 
Right. According to the report, Tokyo Electric Power Company was unable to carry out its first nuclear fuel extraction operation on Tuesday because the footage taken by a camera that was pushed inside the Fukushima Daiichi Unit 2 reactor was unretrievable. Uh, TEPCO tried various ways to recover the footage, like switching the power off and on again, but they failed to do so. Uh, Kyoto News Agency has said that the camera footage is, an, is essential because the radiation level inside the reactor containment vessel is very high and the device is operated remotely adding that there are four cameras in the unit and two of them are malfunctioning. It is reported that the uh, cause of the camera malfunction is being investigated so further work schedules starting Wednesday uh, have not been set yet. Now this would be the fourth time the removal of nuclear fuel debris has been postponed due to camera malfunctioning. Uh, TEPCO is using a newly developed device attached to the end of a 22 meter long telescopic pipe, which is the longest in the world. It was expected to take about a week for the pipe to reach the nuclear fuel debris and a total of two weeks to complete the removal. Now, TEPCO began the removal of the debris last month, but halted the operation after discovering that the order of equipment deployment was incorrect and they resumed the operation last Tuesday. Now, the removal of nuclear fuel debris considered the most difficult task in the decommissioning process has not been successful since the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster. The process was originally scheduled to begin in 2021, but has already been postponed three times due to equipment problems. Jeez, this is the fourth time already that the camera malfunctioned? I, I mean, again, I only saw, what was it, uh, I remember the, the first one, there was a malfunction of not the camera, uh, but uh, the fact that already there's been, what, a three-year delay uh, in this process. The fact that at the very start of the removal of the nuclear debris, which by the way, I think they're only trying to remove like three grams of it in like the first right. stage or uh-huh. something. It's not a whole lot, right? But it's very, very dangerous. Exactly. Uh, it, it's not working right now. I mean, you kind of have to wonder what's going on right now and whether or not uh, how long this the, the commissioning pro- process is going to be. And we ask this because the longer the decommissioning process does go, that means longer t- period of time that the, what is it, the wastewater is going to be uh, released into the ocean, and uh, that means more time for that to reach uh, our coast, the waters off the coast of the Korean Peninsula. But anyways, uh, we'll keep a close tab on this. Guys, thank you very much for coming in on the last day of Choose a Holiday. Have a safe one, and uh, we'll see you guys again. Thank, thank you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.